Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Texas unveiling a new campaign to raise awareness about fentanyl and to save lives as Texas officials seize enough of the drug to kill everyone in the United States. Boston University researchers say they have created a new, deadlier variant of COVID. The news has caused some concern. Democrat Tim Ryan and Republican J.D. Vance from Ohio sparred about taxes and inflation in their debate for the Senate, while Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp clashed on gun laws in a Georgia gubernatorial debate. Republican nominee for Arizona Governor Carrie Lake spoke about morality in a campaign event. Her Democratic opponent refuses to debate her. It seems the Texas governor's fight against the illegal drug trade is yielding results. His office says in the past year they've seized hundreds of millions of lethal doses of fentanyl in Texas. And today's Jessica Beatty has more on the state's efforts. In the past year, Texas law enforcement officers have seized over 342 million lethal doses of fentanyl, according to the governor's office. That's enough to kill every single person in the United States. The giant drug seizures are part of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's Operation Lone Star. It's an effort to counter illegal immigration and the illegal drug trade. Fentanyl is a potent synthetic opioid. It's 50 times stronger than heroin. As little as 2 milligrams could potentially kill a person. Mexican drug cartels are increasingly importing fentanyl from China. Then they put it in counterfeit pills and sell them to unaware buyers in the United States. In a statement Monday, Governor Abbott said fentanyl is a clandestine killer, with Mexican drug cartels strategically manufacturing and distributing the drug disguised as painkillers, stimulants, anti-anxiety drugs, and even candy. At the same time, Abbott unveiled the state's new One Pill Kills campaign. It aims to save lives by informing Texans that just one pill laced with fentanyl can be deadly. It comes as drug overdose deaths are on the rise in the United States. The CDC estimates there were over 107,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States last year. That's up 15 percent from the year before. Last month, Abbott officially designated Mexican cartels as terrorist organizations. It gives state law enforcement more power to bring down the groups and raise public awareness about the cartel's deadly activities. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Boston University researchers have developed a strain of COVID-19 that killed 80 percent of mice infected with it. The research has prompted concern and condemnation. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the story. Researchers at Boston University extracted the Omicron spike protein. They then attached it to the original Wuhan COVID-19 variant, dubbing it Omicron S. While Omicron causes mild, non-fatal infection in mice, Omicron S causes severe disease with a mortality rate of 80%. The researchers say that mice and human immune systems differ greatly and that if the Omicron S hybrid infected humans, it would unlikely be as deadly. However, they found that the new strain was five times more infectious than Omicron when they infected human cells with it. The study's publication drew online condemnation and concern. Infectious disease expert Dr. Paul Hunter says he's concerned about what laboratories are capable of producing. He wonders what they're using the labs for. If they're for diagnostic purposes, then he says they play an important role. However, in his words, if they start having a dual purpose for research that has offensive military implications, that is distressing. Some U.S. intelligence officials said in 2021 they believe COVID-19 either was created inside a lab or had escaped from a facility. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Governor Gavin Newsom announced that California's COVID-19 state of emergency will be lifted at the end of February. Newsom's office says the date was set to ensure the health care system is prepared for a possible winter holiday surge and to give state and local governments time to prepare for the phase-out. The governor's office says the current emergency order continues the state's COVID-19 testing and vaccination programs and prevents a potential strain on health care facilities and workers. The emergency declaration was imposed at the beginning of the pandemic, aiming to prioritize getting protective equipment and setting up testing centers and vaccination sites. Newsom will seek legal changes so nurses can continue dispensing COVID-19 therapeutics and medical facilities can continue allowing lab workers solely to process COVID tests. He will push for the changes when the state legislature meets again. 
President Biden has spent more than a quarter of his term working from Delaware. That's according to Mark Knoller, a longtime unofficial statistician of the White House press corps. He keeps a tally on the president's days away from the White House, and he says so far Biden has spent more than 230 days of his presidency away. Biden has spent 174 days either at his house in Wilmington or his property at Roboth Beach in Delaware. The president has also spent 64 days at the Camp David presidential retreat in Maryland. That surpasses the getaway time of former President Donald Trump. At this point in his tenure, Trump has spent about 150 days away from the White House. Senator Grassley says FBI whistleblowers have revealed that the Bureau has extensive evidence of possible criminal conduct. This by President Joe Biden's son, Hunter, and the president's brother, James Biden. The evidence allegedly includes an FBI interview with Tony Bobolinsky, Hunter Biden's one-time business partner. Bobolinsky claims that Hunter and James Biden helped people connected to the Chinese Communist Party with business deals and investments. They allegedly did so while Joe Biden was vice president. According to a summary of evidence, Grassley says Hunter Biden, James Biden, and their associates created a venture that would enable them to be compensated once Biden was no longer vice president. Democratic candidate Tim Ryan and Republican J.D. Vance clashed on Monday night. The debate for a U.S. Senate seat in Ohio focused on guns, illegal immigration, and abortion. And today's Daniel Monahan has the story. J.D. Vance first rose to prominence after writing Hillbilly Elegy, a book about growing up in poverty in Ohio. Ryan won the Democratic nomination to run for the U.S. Senate seat vacated by retiring Republican Senator Rob Portman. On inflation and his voting for the Inflation Reduction Act, Ryan had this to say. It's been brutal, and I understand that. And that's why I've been calling for a tax cut in the short term uh, to put money in people's pockets. J.D. said that that was a gimmick. He then said that the Inflation Reduction Act drives down the deficit by $300 billion. Vance attacked Ryan's record in response. He says that I believe the tax cut is a gimmick. I think a tax cut's a great idea, but when you propose it, Tim, it is a gimmick. Because in your time in Congress, you voted to raise taxes $6.7 trillion, 113 times. Vance criticized the so-called budget savings of the Inflation Reduction Act, claiming that it actually raises taxes by $20 billion on working people in Ohio. On abortion, the candidates had this to say. If the Republicans control the House and the Senate, we won't be able to codify Roe v. Wade, which I think is the smart move. So I will spend all my time trying to fight a national abortion ban. Vance says a maximum time limit of when abortion access is permitted is reasonable. It's totally reasonable to say you cannot abort a baby, especially for elective reasons, after 15 weeks of gestation. No civilized country allows it. I don't want the United States to be an exception. The candidates also sparred on school shootings. I think allowing properly trained teachers to carry firearms can be part of the solution. I think increasing funding for school resource officers can be part of the solution. He also says a very common sense approach to keeping society safe is making sure that violent criminals are locked up. Crime has become a hot button issue as overall violent crime increased nationally from January to June. According to Ryan, such a concept is too dangerous. That it is a very risky proposition to have a, a, a person that's a school teacher trained to shoot in that environment with all those kids running. The candidates also traded blows on immigration. Vance charged Ryan and the Democratic administration with dubious motives to support immigration. The people he answers to in Washington, D.C., they're very explicit about that. They say that they want more and more immigration because if that happens, they'll ensure that Republicans are never able to win another national election. Ryan countered by calling Vance extremist and also claimed Vance runs around with other so-called extremists like Ted Cruz or Marjorie Taylor Greene. This great replacement theory was the motivator for the shooting in Buffalo, where that shooter had all these great replacement theory writings that J.D. Vance agrees with. Current polls show the candidates neck and neck with Vance holding a razor-thin lead. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Early voting has started in Georgia for this year's midterm elections. Over 2 million Georgians are expected to vote before Election Day. Here's more. Voters in Georgia began to cast their ballots on Monday, the first day of early voting in the state for the U.S. midterm elections. I expect to be an early election. It was great here in Buckhead today, really quick in and out, and everybody uh, just stood in line and waited for their turn. The state features two contentious elections garnering nationwide attention. 
The first is a race for a U.S. Senate seat between Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker. The second is a rematch in the gubernatorial race between current Republican Governor Brian Kemp and Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams. I actually voted for Raphael Warnock and for Stacey Abrams. Um, being a healthcare professional, uh, access to health care is extremely important to me, so I see patients every day who have limited health care or don't have health care at all. So I think the idea of Medicaid expansion is so important, and I believe we'll get that with Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock. So I voted for Kemp in the governor race. I think he's done a great job. Um, I think we've avoided a lot of the struggles that the rest of the country is facing. Um, uh, however, crime is definitely an issue in Atlanta and it needs to be addressed. And I could not in good faith vote for his opponent because of that. That was the deciding factor. More than four million Georgians could vote in this year's midterms. More than half of those are likely to cast ballots before election day. And over 200,000 people have requested mail ballots already. It's estimated that one million poll workers are needed across the U.S. for each election. We are hopeful that there will be enough, um, given the turnout, which should be pretty heavy. And I'm just hopeful that everyone will trust the system. Uh, the system is secure, it works, uh, and that we let poll workers do their jobs. They're volunteers, they're doing this for us. Senator Warnock cast his ballot Monday morning in Atlanta. You're talking about representing 11 million people. It's about who's ready. And the Obamas voted early in Chicago. Michelle Obama was born in the Windy City, and the former president began his political career there. He is scheduled to be in Atlanta next week to campaign on behalf of gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. Georgia candidates for governor squared off in the first of two debates. Incumbent Republican Governor Brian Kemp is in a rematch with Democratic nominee Stacey Abrams. Abrams narrowly lost to Kemp four years ago. Now Kemp is looking for a second term. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on last night's debate. The gubernatorial candidates battled over issues like crime, voting, education, and abortion. Incumbent Brian Kemp clarified his stance on abortion and declared he would not take any further steps to restrict the procedure if re-elected. That's not my desire to do that. Georgians should know that my desire is to continue to help them fight through 40-year high inflation and high gas prices and other things that our Georgia families are facing right now, quite honestly because of bad policies in Washington, D.C., from President Biden and the Democrats that have complete control. Abortion is illegal in Georgia after six weeks of pregnancy. Exceptions are allowed for cases of rape, incest, or health risks to the mother. Challenger Stacey Abrams accused Kemp of being weak on gun laws, allowing dangerous people access to firearms, and flooding the streets with guns. Georgia does not have a waiting period. We do not have universal background checks. And one of the few permits that we had that was helping keep us safe stopped 5,000 people who should not have had weapons from getting them got weakened by this governor with his criminal carry law. Abrams criticized Kemp for signing a bill into law this year that allows gun owners to carry a concealed handgun without a permit. I know how to shoot. My great-grandmother taught me. But I know that the person who is most responsible is the person who holds the weapon. And that is why I will quote Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Kemp defended his position and said he wants to be tougher on gangs and support law enforcement. You have local governments that are holding up concealed weapon permits that are keeping law-abiding citizens from being able to simply uh, uh, used their Second Amendment right to protect themselves and their property and their families. Although Abrams accused Kemp of voter suppression, Kemp touted record turnouts from Democrats and Republicans in Georgia's primaries. It is my time as Secretary of State. I'm the person that created the online voter registration system in this state, where any Georgian can vote, register to vote 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He also reminded voters he was among the Republican governors who relaxed public restrictions early in the COVID-19 pandemic. Libertarian Party candidate Shane Hazel also took part in the debate, but was often caught between the other two candidates and was asked very few questions. You keep going back to guns, Stacey, and I think it's going to be your undoing here in Georgia. Georgia, we're going to have less and less gun laws, whether it's under Republicans or Libertarians. Libertarians don't believe in any gun laws. We believe that you know how to best protect you and your property. Hazel lambasted Kemp for endorsing the government-distributed COVID vaccine. A second debate is planned for October 30th. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 
Another closely watched governor's race is taking place in Arizona. Republican nominee Carrie Lake has been labeled by some as a Trump extremist and election denier. Lake responded to this and addressed the importance of morality in last night's campaign event in Phoenix. NTD's Melina Wisecup was there. We're here in Phoenix, Arizona, a state where the governor's race has garnered national attention. We heard from Republican gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake, who honed in on the moral and spiritual components of modern day politics. This includes everything from criminal justice reform to repairing broken family structures. Here's a look. I want to encourage fathers to, to be in the home. They're so important. And, and maybe it's just one person, one person's voice, and I guess I have a loud mouth talking about how important dads are. But we do need to make that a mission because when we don't have fathers in the home, it's, it's, it's bad for not just mom and kids, it's bad for the spirit of that man as well. The only time you can bring God, you can talk about God is in prison. You can't talk about God in school. You know, it's separation of church and state. No, oh, no, 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 don't bring God in. Don't bring God into junior high and high school. When you can bring God in is in prison. We need to bring God before prison. You want to elect people into office who have a moral compass, who know right from wrong. I think Ronald Reagan was a great example of that. Next, we get some analysis on two developments related to securing elections, a lawsuit in Pennsylvania and an alleged data breach of a Michigan-based election software company. We hear from a think tank's election expert to learn more. Joining us now is Hans von Spakovsky, the manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative and senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Always a pleasure speaking with you, Hans. Thanks for having me. Let's head over to Pennsylvania. Republicans are suing election officials after the acting Secretary of State said undated ballots will be counted. First, is this legal to count those ballots, and how significant is this move? No, this is a this is really a brazen action by the uh, acting Secretary of State. Uh, Pennsylvania law says that a voter has to sign and date an absentee ballot for it to be counted. The state Supreme Court said, yes, that's a valid law. It has to be followed. Uh, You then had a federal appeals court, the Third Circuit, saying, oh, no, 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 you can't enforce that statute because it violates uh, the Federal Civil Rights Act. That was an absurd claim. And in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court recently issued a stay of that opinion and and basically voided it. So the law is in effect. And yet what happened? Secretary of State says, well, I'm just going to defy both the state Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court. And she's instructing election officials to count those ballots. What are the pros and cons of counting undated ballots? Well, the whole point of being able to count a ballot, um, uh, uh, count a ballot that's dated is to ensure that the voter, uh, remember, it's an absentee ballot, it gets mailed in, uh, that the ballot was actually filled out by the voter before the end of election day. Obviously, you don't want a situation where voters wait until they see uh, early early totals, early counts, and then votes. Uh, that's not the way our system works, so there's a good reason for having uh, that kind of re- requirement for a date. And every state, all the states do that. So, Hans, given the history of the courts, where do we expect this lawsuit to go? Well, they filed a lawsuit directly with the state Supreme Court. Now, if the state Supreme Court follows what it previously did, then it will uh, direct an order to the Secretary of State telling her to comply with the law. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the state Supreme Court in Pennsylvania has acted uh, very politically in prior decisions. You know, I I hope they'll do the right thing, but I'm not 100% confident that they will. Let's move on to LA. An election software CEO, Eugene Yu, has surrendered to authorities. Prosecutors are accusing the head of Connect of a massive data breach. Can you unpack this for us? Yeah, he's he's an immigrant from China, became a citizen uh, about two decades ago, and he started a software company that has contracts with election officials in various places around the country, including LA. That software is used to manage poll workers. All of the personal information about poll workers is uh, put into that software, and then they use that to uh, manage the poll workers, everything from letting them know where to appear 
uh, to paying them, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, L.A. has sued him because uh, they are claiming that all of this data, pers very personal data, ended up in China on Chinese servers. Uh, Wu uh, uh, is, is uh, saying that that didn't happen, but L.A. is saying that, in fact, they used uh, Chinese software contractors to do all of this work, uh, as you and I both know, uh, if that kind of data is in China on Chinese servers and there are Chinese companies involved, uh, there's every possibility that the communist government is able to access that information and have control of that information, which is very dangerous. Absolutely. We wouldn't want that information getting into the wrong hands. Hans von Spakovsky, the manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. Congressman Dan Crenshaw, a Republican running for re-election in Texas, in hot water for how he spent campaign money. He's paid more than $350,000 since 2020 to Pink Cilantro. That's a Houston-based branding business that runs his websites, designs his merchandise, manages the online store, and designs Facebook ads. His campaign first commissioned the firm in 2018 to design his branding during his first bid for office. Nothing unusual so far, but it turns out his wife has been paid by Pink Cilantro. Now we have a response from the campaign. A spokesman called the story a non-issue and denied any wrongdoing. He says Crenshaw's wife was contracted only to promote his book, and the total amount she received for her work there was $60,000 commissioned from book sales. And coming up, Hurricane Ian hit Florida's citrus groves hard. Farmers and others in the industry cope with the aftermath and worry about the future. And for the first time in history, Alaska announced closure of its iconic snow crab season. The decision came after a steep decline in the species population. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Citrus is big business in Florida. The industry is valued at more than $6 billion annually, but Hurricane Ian hit the state's citrus groves hard. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Thousands of oranges lay scattered across Roy Petaway's 100-acre grove. The flood and rainwaters have also weakened the orange trees. We're estimating at least 40% of our crop is on the ground and un unusable and unmarketable. Um, we're looking at maybe a 10% tree loss. And again, the trees are what will take even longer to determine. Even without hurricane damage, the crop was predicted to be 32% below last year's. According to the Department of Agriculture, the orange forecast for the whole state puts production at about 1.2 million tons, but it varies for each farmer. The last year's crop was one of the worst that had been picked in the history of, of, of citrus. Um, and we were anticipating, uh, based on the size of a lot of fruit, we were anticipating a very good crop this year. Senator Marco Rubio appeared at a Florida Citrus Mutual event. He said about $3 billion in federal funding is needed to cover costs from loss of crops and trees. This has been part of the state's heritage for a very long time, a key part of, and in many ways, the glue that's held together so many of our communities. And that's the other part that people don't understand. If God forbid the day should come where we lose these groves, or lose agriculture, what happens to the communities that surround it? Well, then they collapse as well. And the devastation comes as things were looking promising for the citrus industry. This is a gut punch, there's no doubt about it. Where there's been some real optimism, uh, even with the, the lower uh, box count, we know that we had good fruit quality going into to this season. We had larger fruit. The trees are looking better. Some of the things we doing are doing, we really feel like are paying off. About half of the fatalities were in Lee County, where the powerful Category 4 hurricane came ashore with 155 mile per hour winds on September 28th. The possible long-term effects on citrus farmers have only added to the tragedy. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A Boy Scout troop from El Paso, Texas, had to be rescued after getting stranded for several days in New Mexico's Gila National Forest. On October 1st, 16 kids and 9 adults set off for what was supposed to be a week-long camping trip, but heavy rain and a rising river prevented the scouts from leaving their campsite. Families back home became worried when they didn't hear from their loved ones. 
New Mexico State Police said they got a call from someone in the troop on October 8th, but bad weather prevented them from attempting a rescue. Officials said the next day, rescuers flew in to find the scouts. State police, along with the New Mexico National Guard, located the troop and airlifted them to safety. The Boy Scouts were reunited with their families at the National Monuments Visitor Center. No one was hurt. For the first time ever, Alaskan fisheries regulators have called off the iconic snow crab season after a sharp decline in the crab population from 2021. Here's some of the details about the decision. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game announced last week that the snow crab industry will close completely for the 2022-23 season, citing crab populations in the Bering Sea as below the regulatory threshold to open up the fishery. In the southwest, another closure was declared for the Red King crab fishery in Bristol Bay for the second year running. That's in contrast to other countries. Both Russia and eastern Canada are reporting bumper harvest this year, where processors are unable to keep up with the workload. Crab is the third major fishery in Alaska, with snow crab and red king crab among the most lucrative. To avoid overfishing, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council launched the Crab Rationalization Program in 2005. It relies on surveys of crab populations to set catch limits for fishermen, processors, and coastal communities. But under the system, the snow crab fishery has almost collapsed. In 2021, snow crab populations in Alaska took a sudden nosedive, with quotas being cut by nearly 90 percent. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's database, commercial landings of Alaska snow crab totaled over 36 million pounds in 2020. But the figure is only 5.6 million in 2021, the smallest in more than 40 years. The cause of the decline is still unknown. Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers Executive Director Jamie Gowen weighed in on social media that the closures could put second and third generation crabbing families out of business. She suggested a reduced level of harvest for the season instead of an outright ban to help balance the needs of fishermen and the associated fishing communities. American Airlines has agreed to pay millions of dollars to settle a lawsuit over baggage fees that are allegedly bogus. The settlement was revealed in court documents filed in Texas. The documents state American has agreed to pay at least $7.5 million to those who accuse it of requiring some passengers to pay checked baggage fees even when they were promised free checked bags. The fees were charged between 2013 and 2021 to some credit card holders and frequent or first-class flyers. As part of the settlement, American will provide full refunds to those who paid the improperly charged fees, but they must file valid claims in a timely manner. Those who are already a part of the class action lawsuit will be notified of the settlement and how to submit those claims. More air travelers are avoiding checking baggage when they fly. A September survey indicates that 60% of flyers reported some kind of disruption while traveling by air this summer. Of the 1,700 Americans in the TripIt survey, one in six said their luggage was lost or delayed. That tracks with federal statistics that show more than 1.7 million bags were mishandled last year by U.S. air carriers. The survey also shows that 41% of flyers now say they will avoid checking in with a bag in the future. 23% say they will use their own bag checking technology, like an Apple AirTag, if they do. Transportation experts agree that staffing shortages at airports combined with high travel demand are at the root of the problem. A Swiss bank reaches a deal in its legal battle with New Jersey's attorney general. The bank, Credit Suisse, has agreed to a $495 million civil settlement over its allegedly toxic securities. It sold the residential mortgage-based securities prior to the 2008 financial crisis. According to the lawsuit, Credit Suisse officials in New Jersey and New York made deals for loans they knew were of poor quality. The 2013 case allegedly alleged Credit Suisse was responsible for $3 billion in damages. In 2017, the bank paid more than $5 billion in order to settle with the Justice Department regarding its alleged practices. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, a setback for Xi'an, the fast fashion brand from China. It involves a $1.9 million fine slapped on the company by New York State. And a heated debate in Berlin over a Chinese shipping company and China's possible investment in a critical German port. Find out the details in just a minute.
As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, a laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Welcome back. Chinese fast fashion retailer Xi'an is back in the spotlight. This time, it's over a nearly $2 million fine, a data breach, and leaked passwords. Here's more. A setback for one of the world's fastest-growing e-retailers, Xi'an. New York State has slapped a $1.9 million fine on Xi'an's parent company. That's over failing to secure customer information from a data breach, plus lying to customers about the scale of the breach. Xi'an is a fast fashion retailer from China. It's popular among millennials and Gen Zers in the U.S. The company's sales in America exploded during the pandemic. At one point in 2021, the numbers even surpassed established brands like H&M and Zara. In 2018, hackers targeted Xi'an's parent company, Zota. They got their hands on the personal information of tens of millions of the company's customers. Among them, over 800,000 are residents of New York. The data breach includes credit card information, names, email addresses, and account passwords. Hackers were able to steal login credentials for 39 million Xi'an users. But Zotop only contacted a fraction of those 39 million users about the data breach. It also didn't take measures to protect other accounts that were compromised. That's according to a statement from the New York State Attorney General. The statement adds, Zotop tried to downplay the scale of the breach. Texas is keeping a closer eye on its teachers' pension funds by limiting their exposure to Chinese stocks. The state's teacher retirement system just got the go-ahead to move to a new benchmark with fewer Chinese stocks. The move would reduce the pension fund's exposure to China by half to about 1.5 percent. The pension fund holds over $180 billion in assets. It will begin a six-month transition period this month to adjust its portfolio. The Chinese regime delays the release of wide swaths of economic data as the Communist Party Congress holds session. Some think the party is holding back news of poor economic performance. One missing figure is third quarter gross domestic product data. China's second quarter GDP growth was a lowly 0.4 percent from a year ago. The regime gave no date for when the missing data would be released. The delay is highly unusual and didn't happen during the last party congress in 2017. The withheld data includes industrial production, retail sales, and the urban jobless rate. Trade data and home price data were also delayed. The UK is issuing a threat alert in response to Chinese recruitment of ex-Royal Air Force pilots. The Chinese military has recruited around 30 British jet pilots to train their Air Force. 
China is luring pilots with large payouts over over $250,000 per year. The UK government said there has been no evidence of a security breach, but officials say these schemes are a risk to the UK and Western countries. The BBC reports that the intelligence alert is designed to warn former military pilots from taking these positions, although it is not against current UK law. The Chinese military is using third-party companies to headhunt the pilots. Among the companies is the Test Flying Academy of South Africa, which has no ties to the South African government. The German government is divided on the China issue and how to handle possible Chinese investment in a critical German port. Let's take a look. The head of Germany's domestic intelligence service, Thomas Holdenwang, gave an update Monday. He said China's influence on the West is far bigger than Russia's. Quoting foreign partners, he added, Russia is the storm, China is climate change. The German government seems divided over how to handle China. A heated debate is happening in Berlin over whether to let a Chinese shipping company invest in a port in Hamburg city. It's Germany's most important port. Intelligence says China could use stake it holds in critical infrastructure as leverage to pursue political goals, and control over a port would be considered critical infrastructure. Germany's economy ministry also wants to veto the Chinese company's bid to buy a stake in the port. But the chancellor Lee seems to be leaning more in favor of the business side. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says decoupling from China is the wrong answer. Schultz said at a Berlin business conference last week that Germany must continue to do business with China. Schultz reportedly plans to visit Beijing in early November, making him the first G7 leader to travel to China since the start of the pandemic. Decoupling from China wouldn't be easy for Germany. China has been Germany's largest economic partner since 2015. Last year alone, the two countries exchanged almost $240 billion worth of goods. Back when taking office, Schultz said he emphasized a values-based foreign policy, one that would focus on democracy and human rights. Schultz's cabinet pushed for a harsher stance on China. This marked a shift in attitude from former Chancellor Merkel, who largely took a business-first stance toward China. Just ahead, Iran is accused of supplying suicide drones to Russia used for deadly attacks in Ukraine. Iran denies involvement. And police in Denmark have been investigating the Nord Stream pipeline leaks. We'll bring you what they found after the break here on NTD News. The United States is among countries accusing Iran and Russia of violating a U.N. resolution. That's for the use of suicide drones that Ukraine says are being used in deadly attacks. Iran denies involvement in the attacks. Here's the story. Rubble, helmets and candles laid outside the Iranian embassy in Kyiv. These were protest props used by a group of Ukrainians on Monday night to demand that Iran stop selling drones to Russia. Coming after a so-called kamikaze drone hit a block of flats in Kyiv. The attack killed at least four people, including a woman who was six months pregnant. Ukraine said the attacks were carried out by Iran-made suicide drones, which fly to their target and detonate. The United States, Britain and France agreed that Iran supplying drones to Russia would violate a UN Security Council resolution that endorsed the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and six powers. Iran's foreign minister continued to deny on Monday that it's supplying Russia with drones, while the Kremlin has not commented. But the U.S. has accused Iran of lying, with State Department spokesman Vedan Patel saying Russia was not only receiving drones from Iran, its operators were also being trained in Iran. Russia deepening an alliance with Iran uh, is something the whole world, uh, should, especially those in the region uh, and across the world, frankly, should be seen as a f- profound threat and something that um, any country should uh, pay very close attention to. Patel warned the U.S. may impose more sanctions, echoing calls by some EU foreign ministers to crack down on Iran over the issue. A Russian warplane crashed Monday in the port city of Yeysk in southern Russia near the border with Ukraine. 
The Russian Defense Ministry says the Su-34 bomber was on a training mission when one of its engines caught fire during takeoff. It crashed in a residential area, causing a fire as several tons of fuel exploded on impact. A blaze engulfed several floors of a nine-story apartment building. Two crew members bailed out safely. At least 17 apartments were affected by the fire, and about 100 residents were evacuated and given temporary shelter. Authorities report at least 13 dead and dozens injured. Russian President Vladimir Putin was informed of the crash and sent the health and emergency ministers to the scene. Emergency services said they had managed to contain the fire hours after the crash. A spokesperson for the Russian Investigative Committee said an investigation is underway into the cause of the incident. Copenhagen police said today the damage to the two Nord Stream gas pipelines was caused by powerful explosions. The Danish findings were similar to those of Swedish prosecutors. They reported that two other holes in the pipelines were also apparently caused by explosions. They announced that authorities were investigating the case as an act of gross sabotage. The damage to the pipelines linking Russia and Germany has become a flashpoint in the Ukraine crisis. World leaders have also described the damage as an act of sabotage, but it remains unclear who might be behind the detonations. Danish police could not say when the investigation will conclude. The Kremlin said today that the investigations appeared to have been set up with the intention of falsely blaming Russia. Over to Vienna. The trial begins today for six men accused of being complicit in a 2020 terror attack. The attack killed four people and wounded 23 others. A 20-year-old shooter opened fire into crowds as they sat on terraces enjoying a warm evening. He was fatally shot by police within minutes. Police believe he carried out the attack alone. However, the six defendants are accused of providing various kinds of help beforehand, such as supplying the rifle. Five of the men have long been known to domestic intelligence as supporters of Islamic State, like the attacker. One lawyer says his client intends to plead not guilty. He visited the shooter's apartment, but, quote, did not provide a psychological contribution. According to the lawyer, he helped police identify the attacker when he saw the images. More tragedy now in Paris. A 12-year-old girl was murdered. The arrested suspect is an illegal immigrant, and some opposition parties have seized on the killing to call for tougher immigration policies. The Paris prosecutor's office said the girl disappeared on Friday, and her body was discovered later that evening in a plastic trunk outside her home. She suffered cuts and bruises and died from suffocating. The main suspect is a 24-year-old woman. She was seen on security camera footage exiting the building in the afternoon, carrying heavy luggage, including the trunk in which the victim was found. Authorities confirmed reports that the suspect is an illegal immigrant. Some politicians say the show's failings in the government's law and order policies. Newspapers citing police and judicial sources say the suspect is Algerian. Climate activists blocked a busy highway in Rome during a protest on Monday, and motorists were not happy. The demonstration was saged by members of the climate movement last generation. They were protesting new gas drilling projects. They halted traffic during rush hour, causing major disruption for commuters trying to get to work. It also caused angry reactions from motorists before police cleared the road by physically carrying the protesters off the highway. Last Generation is part of a network of climate civil disobedience groups active in several countries. The groups include Just Stop Oil in the UK, Stop Old Growth in Canada, and Declare Emergency in the United States. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, the Paris Motor Show is in full swing. This year, car makers are displaying new electric models. Europe has promised to phase out internal combustion cars by 2035. And Rolls-Royce unveils its first fully electric vehicle and tells how the car fulfills a prophecy by a company founder. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute.
Take a look at these age spots. They seem to vanish right before your eyes. Oh my God. If you want to see blemishes seem to disappear in seconds for a flawless complexion, you can't get this look with regular old fashioned makeup. So to get results like this and look years younger instantly, we have big news. At Luminous, we've taken our airbrush and now made it so easy for every day. Introducing Breeze, our all new cordless handheld two in one airbrush system that applies makeup and skincare faster and easier than anything you've ever tried before. Putting the drops in. Just hit the button real simple. It's it's so wow. easy. It knows exactly where it needs to blend and where it needs to go. The makeup you're using can look dry and cakey and can make your skin look rough. But with Breeze, you can go from this to this. The secret is how our premium foundations blend onto the skin with an ultra fine mist using the power of air. Very little foundation is needed. Up to 10 times less makeup compared to what you're using. But you're also getting three times more coverage at the same time. Time. That's maximum coverage using less makeup. It's clear. Traditional makeup can make you look older, while Breeze is specially designed for maturing skin, helping it to look smooth and so much younger. It's your anti-aging, moisturizing primer, concealer, and foundation, all in one simple step. And with so many shades, we give you a color match guarantee, so you're guaranteed the perfect shade that's just right for you. We're so confident you're gonna love our all-new, best-ever two-in-one handheld airbrush system. We give you a full 30-day money-back guarantee Call or go online and use this special promo code right now so you can get Breeze, our all-new handheld two-in-one airbrush to try at home for only $19.95. And you'll even get free shipping. There is a new and exciting way to look dramatically younger with Breeze. Luminous is not available in stores. You can only get this exclusive offer here, so don't wait. Order your new cordless handheld Breeze now. Call 800-451-9044 or go to getbreeze.com. Order now. Europe is working on its promise to phase out internal combustion cars by 2035. Car makers show off new models at the Paris Motor Show. And today's Andrew Thomas has the details on the latest EVs. The Paris Motor Show kicked off on Monday after a four-year pandemic hiatus. French car makers are dominating the show. Renault CEO Luca De Meo flaunted the forever electric concept car. I think Renault is a popular brand. Pop, as the British put it, it means we're into the mid-range. We don't do entry-level cars. That's Dacia's job. We need to offer mid-level cars. Our offer isn't going premium. We are producing C-segment cars that a normal family might buy. Brands like Dacia are trying to be affordable for the average consumer. As the cost of living crisis continues in Europe, there's a need for cheaper cars. It means that more and more people really make choices. They choose what is the essential for their consumption, and cars are part of it, and more and more people are choosing Dacia. Renault's mobilized brand has a different solution, focusing on car sharing and rentals. So if you just need a car, you know, car sharing is, is you pay at the minute, you pay at the hour. Uh, for, same for ride sharing. So you don't have to bear all the expenses linked to the car maintenance, etc., etc. Car makers face challenges making the switch to electric vehicles. Electric engines are more expensive, and components such as semiconductors are not readily available to European car makers. Electric cars is uh, more expensive, uh, 30 on, or 40% than uh, uh, thermal vehicles, and uh, they have a big problem to commercialize it. So uh, here you have some banks, uh, to help car makers to commercialize uh, uh, electric vehicles. There's still a long way to go to phase out internal combustion engines by 2035. It's part of the EU's push to meet its commitments under the 2015 Paris Climate Accords. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Super luxury car maker Rolls Royce has unveiled its first ever fully electric coupe, the Spectre. It comes more than 120 years after its founder predicted an electric future for his cars. It goes back to the year 1900 when uh, one of our founders, Charles Rolls, made a prophecy. And that prophecy was that electric drive is a perfect fit and everything you experience in the car gives you that 
pleasing feeling of riding uh, on a magic carpet ride, wafting through the country, flight on land in electric form. Spectre can accelerate from 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 4.3 seconds and is expected to have a range of 320 miles per charge. But its performance won't be confirmed until it has completed rigorous test driving. Onboard technology includes 18 different sensors. They monitor the suspension, steering, braking, and power to keep the car stable when cornering on any road surface. The traditional opulent finish remains unchanged. Available options include thousands of illuminated stars in the doors, roof lining, and dashboard. The company says it expects to end the production of its iconic V12 engine and to have switched to a fully electric fleet by the end of the decade. And still to come, a 95-year-old runner says exercise is key to a healthy old age and a growing field of aging research seems to back him up. Details to come on NTD News Today. A growing number of scientists are studying the symptoms of old age like dementia and heart disease. And today's Andrew Thomas has the details about what they've found at a cellular level and why staying active may be key. Richard Soller started running again just before turning 50. He's since competed in races across North America, including two marathons, and he's still competing at 95 years old. I've always... Uh thought that exercise is the best medicine there ever was invented. <laughs> I think everyone should keep moving. Staying healthy and active later in life is a goal that eludes so many. But a flourishing field of aging research called cellular senescence could help. There used to be a widely accepted notion that cells could replicate endlessly. But in the 1960s, scientist Leonard Hayflick made an accidental discovery. After about 50 population doublings of the original uh, cells, I noticed that the cells stopped dividing. Eventually, they then enter a senescent state in response to damage over time. The body removes most of them, but others linger, not quite dead, and harming normal cells nearby. They accumulate in older bodies. Mounting evidence links this to an array of age-related conditions like dementia, heart disease, and osteoporosis. But initial research indicates that exercise could help. The main thing in, I think, growing older is to, again, keep moving. Do something with your body and your mind. Soller says exercise keeps him fit enough to handle whatever comes his way. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Have you noticed that with the change in seasons, your body can feel a bit different? What is it about autumn that makes us feel dry? Here's Gina Marie, who brings us Strong Mind and Body. The ancients in China studied the human body and its relationship to outer influences. In autumn, we naturally feel dry conditions taking effect. Wan Wok Wai is a Hong Kong registered Chinese medical practitioner. He offers some recommendations to counter autumn's drying effects on the skin and other organs. The Equinox Herald's Seasonal Change Days and nights are equal in length and the weather turns cooler and drier. Wong says that autumn dryness can easily damage our lungs. We may also experience skin issues or gastrointestinal discomfort. The key to wellness is to promote the production of fluids to overcome the dryness and restore our energy. Traditional Chinese medicine practitioners believe that taking good care of our health means we adapt to natural laws. During autumn and winter, we have to exhaust our yin energy to resist the dryness and maintain the internal moisture levels. That's why we need to restore it. Dryness can cause many problems, coughs, respiratory issues skin rashes, eczema, dry skin, and hair loss. The lungs affect the large intestine, so constipation and abdominal pain are more common. The answer lies in nourishing the yin energy. Good habits this time of year include drinking plenty of water and adopting good living routines. Going to bed early and rising early are beneficial. Also, be sure to choose foods that are rich in gelatine and have a sticky texture. Examples include snow fungus, milk, 
here, Lily, Honey and Egg Yolk. Also, try foods with a sour taste. Examples include strawberry, apple, orange, grape, blueberry, lemon, plum and hawthorn. Turning to soccer, or football as they say abroad, Real Madrid's French forward Karim Benzema claimed the 2022 Ballon d'Or Award this week for the world's best men's player. The women's award went to Barcelona's Spanish midfielder Alexia Puteas for the second time in her life. On stage at the award ceremony, Benzema called it a dream come true from his childhood. He is the first French player to win the trophy since 1998. Benzema starred in Real Madrid with 44 goals in 46 games last season, including 15 goals in the European Champions League, earning his club a record-extending 14th title. The Women's Award winner, Puteas, was named FIFA's best female player earlier this year. She was the top scorer in the Champions League last season with 11 goals and scored 18 goals in the Primera Division. But the 28-year-old missed the Euros in Spain with an ACL injury. Other winners included Real's Thibaut Coutois for the best goalkeeper, Barcelona's 18-year-old midfielder Gavi for the Copa Trophy for best player under 21, and Bayern Munich forward Sadio Mane for the inaugural Socrates Award. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.